All right. So the story that I have about my son is actually from this morning. Uh, we were I'm trying to find where we were. Last thing I talked about was the MMR vaccine being licensed, right? Yeah. 1971. Yeah. Um, the story about my son is that he was being somewhat of a poop this morning and not wanting to uh, to go and like pretty much having a meltdown um, when it was time to leave because he wanted to turn the TV off on and we could not figure out what it was. We turned the TV off, we turned the TV back on. Turns out he wanted to pause the TV. Oh. So, because okay. it was off, but it was still on that way. Wow. It's actually pretty smart. <laughs> I thought it was pretty smart that I figured out that's what he wanted. <laughs> but yes, it, it was kind of clever. So, that that's the that's the Brooks story for today. All right, uh, so we were talking about the MMR vaccine. Um, those weren't the only vaccines that were trying to be developed at the time. Um, specifically, I want to talk about two vaccines in not a whole lot of de detail, but two vaccines that individuals um, used to have or that they were having issues developing. So the one is RSV. And the other is strep throat. And these are two vaccines that um, I don't believe we still have a good vaccine against, um, although we've made some progress on the RSV uh, front. Um, so you guys are familiar with strep throat, right? Do you guys know what RSV is? It's respiratory syncytial virus. Um, it was the virus that earlier this winter everyone was kind of making a big deal about because it was kind of making a resurgence um, once the COVID protocol started um, coming down. Um, normally RSV uh, for most people is just a, a cold when you get it. So it's, it's one of the viruses that could be considered to give the common cold, although some individuals have more serious reactions uh, to it. Uh, my son, was that in January or was that last year? I don't know. Earlier, my son had to actually um, get go to the hospital. We went to the hospital um, because he was sick and coughing a lot and um, having issues. Uh, they actually sent us, they like made us an inpatient there because his oxygen levels were too low due to um, RSV. Obviously, he's fine now. Uh, we got his tonsils removed, so that is hopefully going to help the situation because part of it was that they would swell up so much bad that um, he would have trouble breathing with it. But um, So RSV can be serious, although it's not the most serious uh, virus out there because for a lot of people, it's just a common cold. Um, with both of these, you used to have uh, problems that would arise. So with the strep throat vaccine... Um, this one failed because individuals would actually create autoantibodies that would attack their own uh, immune system. So they would um, essentially have a autoimmune disorder uh, due to this virus, although it was one of those things that would um, only arise when you were exposed to strep throat, uh, the strep virus, or um, or had the strep uh, vaccine somewhere way exposed to it. RSV uh, did something that was kind of surprising. So what it resulted in was vaccine associated. enhanced respiratory disease. What does that sound like? Respiratory indicates that it's 
in the respiratory system, lungs and that stuff. Uh, vaccine associated indicates that it's connected to vaccines in some way. Enhanced means that it's more powerful. So this was actually a enhancement of subsequent infections. So you think about it, you take vaccines in order to make subsequent infections less detrimental to you. With this vaccine, it actually made them more detrimental to you and it enhanced the response that your body had against it. Um, the exact reason that this happens uh, isn't completely known. Um, there are a few things that they have discovered with this. So T helper two response, we talked about that in um, the uh, other section of um, the class last Friday. Um, this was exaggerated in these individuals. So essentially these individuals would have a, the immune system overactivated in these cases. Um, Exactly why this that happens and why the subsequent thing happens um, isn't completely clear. It led to antibody mediated complement activation. So we, we've mentioned complement a few times. We haven't completely talked about it. Um, Complement is something that essentially will mark uh, invaders uh, of the cell uh, for destruction. Um, it does this in a number of ways. One way is the antibody-mediated uh, response. Um, so this uh, would actually enhance this, which seems like a good thing, but you don't want an overactive immune ses uh, system. Um, but it was also associated with weak neutralization. So the antibodies were um, activating the uh, immune response, but it wasn't necessarily uh, attacking the virus uh, like it uh, should, and that was leading to problems. The reason they think that this may have happened, um, you know, it's kind of hard to go back and actually test this because you don't really want to re, uh, remake the problem, but the virus was inactivated by formalin. And formalin, you know, you want to inactivate the virus, but sometimes that leads to uh, problems that will arise. This is kind of what happened with the killed uh, measles vaccine and the atypical measles syndrome. Um, but it, the formalin would deform the virus. And now the antibodies weren't as good against it. So again, a lot not really known about why, but in this time that was almost kind of seen as the golden age of vaccine development, you had a lot of uh, successful va vaccines being made. There were some notable failures uh, in, the, um, in the pipeline. So this brings us to cowpox, and when I say cowpox, I'm really talking about the smallpox vaccine. So we're getting into the 1960s now. In the 1960s, um, was smallpox really an issue in the United States? No. When was the last case of, um, I don't, I don't want to call it endemic because endemic implies that it was there. What, what was the nat last natural occurring uh, case of smallpox that wasn't imported. Does anyone remember? Yeah, like 1939. So that was 1939 was the last one before someone had brought it into New York. In the United States in general, the last case wasn't too far after that, 1949. So from 1949 to 1965,
all the smallpox cases were imported from somewhere else. They had essentially um, choked off the disease in the United uh, States. Um, because of this, there were some cases of it being imported, but once it was imported, it really didn't uh, gain a foothold and spread uh, in the uh, states. Um, because of this, an individual by the name of C. Henry Kemp, we've mentioned him earlier, he started proposing I should say proposed stopping routine smallpox vaccination. Anybody remember any of the reasons why he thought that it should be stopped besides it not being present in the United States? Okay, so there were rare but significant side effect effects to it. Uh, statistically speaking, um, during this time from 1949 to 1965, when there was no naturally occurring cases of smallpox, so you can imagine that there was no natural or no deaths from smallpox during this time, if there wasn't any cases, an estimated 200 to 300 children died due to the adverse effects of the vaccine. Um, on top of that, another 5,000 or so had severe complications of some sort. So that was the main reason. Uh, Henry Kemp, uh, during his time as a vaccine researcher and following it, was really an advocate for um, children's health and was a, a big move, a uh, big mover in the pediatric uh, community. Um, so th this was a significant contribution, but there was other things that uh, were mentioned as well. How did the uh, contagiousness of smallpox compare to other diseases at the time? It was less. I, I, Less than once, uh, specifically. So the one that w it gets compared to was measles. So measles was significantly more infectious. It could spread uh, more easily than... Um, the smallpox vaccine. Uh, with smallpox, usually you weren't spreading it unless you had symptoms of it. Um, so you would know not to be around someone that was sick because they're obviously showing uh, symptoms. Whereas measles, you had the spread of it both before and after you showed symptoms. And on top of that, it was just more contagious in general. Being exposed to it, the virus had a better chance of taking hold and causing problems. So because it was, um, so measles was significantly more infectious, I should say, than smallpox, just to make that clear which one I'm talking about. Um, for that reason, he didn't think that it was necessary to really have routine vaccination because you could kind of see when an infection was start or a uh, epidemic was starting to take hold and do something about it. You could vaccinate those that were exposed to individuals um, that had the smallpox 
uh, because it takes a while for the disease to incubate uh, before it starts spreading. And you can quarantine these individuals uh, too to prevent the spread of the uh, virus. So um, it could be controlled by other means uh, as well. Another reason is that imported smallpox would usually only infect close contacts, and those con close contacts were usually adults. So it wasn't even children that were being exposed to the imported uh, smallpox cases uh, in most instances. Um, this also relates to another one of his arguments, was that the immunity didn't appear to last into adulthood, or at least not in all cases. Immunity did seem to wane with the smallpox vaccine. So you're, small, you're vaccinating a population that really wasn't at risk, and then later when they had a higher chance of being at risk, uh, the vaccine wasn't actually doing any good. So those were all the arguments that uh, he uh, made others made arguments against that. So what do you think the arguments against stopping uh, routine vaccination were? It's just another shot. As I mentioned before, the adverse events that were discussed were rare. And while it was probably due to the vaccination, it wasn't 100% clear that it was related to the vaccine. That's part of the reason why that uh, 200 to 300 number is an estimate and kind of a broad range. Um, due just to the nature of disease, it's hard to say when you give someone a vaccine and they have an adverse event, whether it was related to that vaccine or just something else that would have happened at that time. <laughs> uh, statistically speaking, it probably was due to the smallpox vaccine in at least some of those cases. So that's why they kind of give you a range of those 200 to 300 uh, deaths. What might happen if you stop uh, vaccinating against something that's been eradicated. Okay. They were fearful that the smallpox epidemics would return. Um, to a degree, they may have been correct in this, that there would have been more people that were susceptible, so it had a greater chance of uh, taking hold. Um, however, if you look at it, shortly after this was made, routine vaccination did stop in most places in the United States, um, and smallpox didn't take uh, hold back in the United States, even though that uh, happened. But it's hard to say whether um, if they would have just, you know, done it a little bit earlier, if it would have given just a little bit more kindling for this virus to burn through before it would have burned out. So it's one of those things. We don't know what would have happened because we can't go back and undo it. We don't have a time machine to run a controlled experiment. Um, and while uh, smallpox appeared to be eradicated in the United States and most of uh, North America, there were places where it was still endemic, 
and still caused problems. And they were concerned that stopping vaccination would set a bad example for places that uh, were still dealing with it. Um, to a degree, uh, I think Americans try to think of themselves as someone that the rest of the world uh, looks up to. I think that used to be more true than um, it is nowadays. Um, people are getting more pride in their nationality, but that could just be that I have a different perspective as I get older about how I feel uh, feel the world has viewed the United States too. So I don't know if that's just my personal experience or if it's actually true that we used to be a little bit more respected than what we are uh, now. But when it came to healthcare in the mid 1900s, the United States was one of the leading uh, places in the development and uh, distribution of um, medicines and interventions. Um, and so if the United States stops vaccinating, places might wonder, okay, wh what's wrong with this vaccine uh, that the United States won't use it? Um, and so they might quit using it when um, that happens. The result of this argument that Kemp had with his critics ultimately uh, did not result in the ceasing of vaccination. Um, some think Kemp was just a little bit ahead of his time in getting uh, individuals to stop vaccinating it. But um, so this was 1965 that this had happened. By 1972, most states had stopped routine vaccination. Um, and 1980, uh, smallpox was eventually declared um, eradicated. And every case of smallpox after that was due to um, a lab accident that would have happened that happened to expose an individual to the smallpox. So um, that really was kind of the waning uh, time of the smallpox. Uh, the success in eradicating smallpox really didn't happen due to the uh, routine vaccination that was occurring. Individuals had more success with a procedure known as ring, uh, ring vaccination. Anybody recall what that was from your reading? Yeah, so essentially, this individual has smallpox, gets infected. He was exposed to these individuals. This would be the individuals that get vaccinated. quarantine and or isolated. Meanwhile, these individuals don't get the vaccine. What were the advantages of doing it this way? It's uh, less of a kind of burden of the vaccination and isolation for everyone. Okay, so can I say that it was easier? Um, because it was easier to just vaccinate, you know, 10 people versus a population of 10,000. Is there anything else that you were implying with that or? Okay. Cheaper. Obviously, 10 vaccines is cheaper than 10,000 vaccines. And going back to the adverse events, this is safer. If it takes 10,000 
uh, vaccinations before you have, uh, you know, 10 adverse events and one death, doing 10 of these means that chances are there won't be any of these adverse events or deaths that would occur. It might just do it a chance, but, you know, that is a very small chance. So it was easier, cheaper, and safer, if you can read that. I don't know why I cut it off. There we go. I don't know. Um, so why don't we do this with all vaccines? Okay, so it, it has to do with the epidemiology of it. Was that what you were going to say? Yes. Okay. It, essentially, measles. You have measles, it spreads way too fast, and it spreads before you know you're infected. Trying to do this with measles did not lead to success. This, this was something uh, individuals actually tried to do, is ring vaccination with measles. Uh, there was no way of containing it due to the nature of it. Uh, similarly, with the COVID uh, epidemic, unless you are out there uh, testing everybody every day, there's the chance of um, asymptomatic spread or pre-symptomatic spread that would lead to spreading the disease before you are actually able to vaccinate against it. So while it works good for some uh, diseases, those diseases have to have a very specific uh course of disease where uh, it takes a while before you are symptomatic, um, you don't spread it before you're symptomatic, and you can isolate uh, the individuals um, in that way. And pretty much anyone that has the disease, needs it needs to be obvious that they have the disease, that you can't just walk away from it without being known. It may be a little bit more possible to do this now that we have testing, but that would involve routine testing for the different diseases that um, you're testing for, which would kind of cut out the cheaper response to it, as well as making it easier. Probably would still be safer, though, if you only gave vaccines to people that were um, exposed to it. But most likely people wouldn't want to get tested and would... Um, probably, it probably wouldn't work for that reason as well. Um, so due to his position on this, Kemp was largely ostracized by the vaccine community. And he instead became an advocate for children's health and uh, safety. Um, he became a uh, Trying to think of how the how it's actually stated, he basically became very vocal against uh, child abuse and protecting children from child abuse. Um, there is, and we'll see this later in the class when we talk about um, some other things down the road. There was this idea at one point that uh, individuals would come to school with like bruises and stuff. And it was actually being blamed on medical care when it was actually due to um, child abuse is what they think it was in most cases. And so um, he essentially was starting to call people out on that and made it more of a public issue um, and really did a lot of good uh, in that side of the uh, community. Question or just holding your hand like that? Okay. So Henry Kemp, overall... Uh, pretty good guy. Um, overall, if we look at what uh, went on for pretty much the rest of the 1960s and 1970s, um, you did see some resurgence of diseases
is people became complacent. It wasn't necessarily that they were anti-vaccine, but as vaccines became successful, the disease is that they were fighting became less scary because they were less common. Um, and so you had sometimes that these diseases resurging because people wouldn't get vaccinated because, oh, why bother? The disease doesn't seem that bad or does not seem a problem uh, in this community. And sometimes you would have to pay for the vaccine uh, yourself. Um, due to this, the Carter administration Increase the spending and the focus on immunization. And they helped make it a priority for some individuals that, you know, weren't really against vaccinating their children, but didn't really see the point by requiring it. for uh, school-aged children. So while it was, there, there were instances where it was required to attend school to be vaccinated, but it became more common uh, and more universal during the Carter administration that this would uh, be the case. All right, questions. Anything else that you thought was interesting from this chapter that you'd like to talk about? When the vaccine and the measles worse, or it could have been a different disease, and then um, where this vaccine made that disease worse, but kind of a it's kind of the same thing, yeah. I, I think that it's um, different in the sense that the RSV was triggering a very precise response in the respiratory system, whereas the measles wasn't um, a wasn't necessarily triggering just the respiratory system. If I think correctly, the measles was, while it was is somewhat of a respiratory virus, it was maybe causing like encephalitis or something. I could be wrong about that. But it was similar in that in both cases, they thought that the way they were inactivating the virus um, was essentially deforming the virus such that the antibodies being produced weren't um, effective in neutralizing the virus and then were atta attacking other parts and triggering other parts of the immune system that was essentially making the response very worse. So yeah, it was a similar, they, I don't know that they know, uh, actually know uh, that it is, but it seems very similar uh, in, in the, how they're proposing both of the problems arose. Other questions or things that you want to bring up regarding this? All right. Um, so I'm going to move on to Chapter 7, but as a reminder, read Chapters 11 through 12 or 11 through 16 for Immune for Friday. And um, for Monday, try to finish Chapter uh, 7. So chapter seven, the big event that uh, let it off was what? Yep. So DPT vaccine roulette. You guys know what roulette is? Yes. Okay. Because you are gamblers or whatever. So you, you, you understand the, the reference here when they talk about that. Okay. Uh, essentially, this was a documentary. It aired in April of 1982. Uh, the reporter, Leah Thompson, she actually wins an Emmy for her performance in this. 
Um, what this, what was this about? What is DPT? What's the P stand for? Because that's the one that I talk about the most. Pertussis. Pertussis is what? What's the other common? Whooping cough. So D is diphtheria, P is pertussis, and T is tetanus. So this was a vaccine that was targeted against those three disease. Um, the one that they were concerned about, most people were concerned about, was the pertussis vaccine. Um, what did this documentary really depict? Like when, vaccines go wrong. when vaccines go wrong. Um, for the most part, it was children affected by this vaccine. They showed instances where children were crying um, screaming. They showed instances where uh, children were um, supposedly brain damaged due to the vaccine. And they also showed some children that were supposedly um, killed to uh, the vaccine. And so in this, the um, parents blamed the pertussis vaccine for the cause it for causing all the problems their children are having and this influenced a number of people and was ended up being kind of a serious blow to the vaccine uh, program so some key people that this ended up influencing Jeffrey Schwartz, who was an environmental lawyer. So let's all stare over here at the environmentalist. No. Um, so he worked for the Health Education and Welfare Department in the uh, um, government. Um, in 1981, about a year before this had or I think it was a little over a year before this had aired, um, his daughter had grand mal seizures. Jake, what's a grand mal seizure? I don't know what a grand mal seizure is. I don't either. I, I, I knew at one point and I looked it up, but I've forgotten what a grand mal seizure was, and I assumed that you you would. What's that? Is it just a seizure that you can actually see happening? Oh, someone look it up. Causes a loss of consciousness and violent muscle contractions. Okay, so it's a very it's a very grand seizure. So grand grand is big, mal is bad, very big bad seizure. Um, <laughs> I know Spanish. <laughs> Yo taco espanol muy mal, muy mal. Um, so she had that after getting her third DTP uh, vaccine. Notice that um, I will probably write it both ways. The official name was DTP, but a lot of people called it DPT. I have no idea why dyslexia or something. I don't know. Um, so after her third shot, uh, she had seizures and he remembered this uh, a year later. Um, I don't recall her having any long-term problems, but it wouldn't surprise uh, the book saying that she had any long-term problems, but it wouldn't surprise me because um, really the parents that have these that were against this um, we're probably thinking of children that kind of had lasting effects due to the vaccine. Um, another individual was Kathy Williams. 
Uh, she was a mom whose 18th month old son um, would scream. for eight hours after his second shot of DTP. Um, and this was especially uh, strong in our mind because this was only four days before our vaccine roulette uh, aired. And so it was very a very recent uh, event. Um, afterwards, she claimed that he was sickly and regress mentally. No, that's the wrong person. And behave. Had allergies and behavioral issues. It was the last person's son Barbara Lowe Fisher, she probably becomes the best known uh, one of these individuals and has the most impact on um, the anti-vaccination movement going forward. Um, she was a publicist. Her son was in a shock-like state. For 24 hours after his third shot. And he is the one that she claimed was sickly and regressed mentally. These three individuals um, contacted Leah Thompson and also got together with other parents and would ultimately form the organization that was known as Dissatisfied Parents Together. They took the DPT to represent the vaccine and made it represent something else um, and really brought a lot of awareness beyond just the documentary and um, change in how ultimately their movement led to changes in how the laws uh, functioned on the safety of uh, vaccines. Um, there probably is some good that these individuals accomplished as far as the regulation of vaccines and making sure vaccines uh, are safe um, for uh, other for individuals that are receiving them. Um, but a lot of the things that these individuals were concerned about were problems that most people think, or most scientists think, are imagined or perceived problems that aren't necessarily caused by uh, vaccines, even though um, it, the, some people think that they um, are. This uh, society, this dissatisfied parents together, um, later took on a different name uh, known as the National Vaccine Information Center, which I think is a little bit more subtle uh, in, in the name that you don't necessarily know what they're uh, position is in it, and um, they come off as a society that just wants to inform parents about uh, vaccines, um, even though they clearly have a stance that they are anti-vaccines. Uh, so this ultimately mobilized a parents movement that would have a lot of uh, res lot of um, subsequent consequences on legislation legislation as it uh, related to vaccines. Um, just a few more notes about roulette. So 
in case you didn't know, um, documentaries that you find on Netflix and television, they aren't peer reviewed. People can put, say whatever they want, as long as they can get the money to, um, to, you know, publish them. And so typical of, uh, most documentaries, they took claims. That's not to say all documentaries are bad or even that some documentaries aren't informative, even if they have misinformation on them. And they certainly can be uh, entertaining. But they did take the claims uh, made by the parents as fact. So they weren't necessarily critical in trying to get both sides of the stories. The scientists that were questioned claim that their statements were taken out of context. And so what they made it seem like the scientists were saying wasn't necessarily what they uh, were trying to say. And another thing that the documentary did was that it minimized the threat of whooping cough as a disease. For children, uh, whooping cough was a very severe disease in some instances, and we'll talk more about that probably on Monday, because we'll talk about immune on Friday. So, questions? All right, you guys have a good Wednesday. I'll see you guys next time. Um, I'm going to make it do Friday night since we're kind of behind on the lecture, but yeah, I will, I will, it'll be the same, um, 20, 20 bullet points, 10 from the immune, 10 from the other, um, content.